So I'd like to welcome everyone to Brookings. Uh, my name is Liaquat Ahmed. I'm a trustee. Um, and we're very honored to have Ambassador Froman with us today. Um, Ambassador Froman just assumed the role of U.S. Trade Representative in June. Um, and before that, he served in the White House as the Assistant to the President and the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs. Um, Ambassador Froman is a longtime friend of Brookings. He's, sp he's spoken here many times. He's been a participant at the, uh, at the Bloom Roundtable on Global Poverty for many years. Um, actually, the, the roundtable is currently taking place, um, and Strobe and other senior Brookings uh, uh, the leadership are there. So, uh, uh, so I'm very, I'm, I'm, I know they're very sorry to have missed this morning's session. Um, this is the first time that Ambassador Froman is speaking at Brookings in his capacity as U.S. Trade Representative. Um, and he'll be talking about the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, also known as AGOA. Uh, it was signed into law in May 2000, and it offers African countries that open their economies uh, trade incentives with the United States. Um, it's set to expire in 2015, um, and it's one of the defining pillars of the U.S.-Africa trade relationship. Um, and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative plays a key role in the discussions on its extension. Um, Brookings has just issued a um, report uh, sponsor, uh, written by the Africa Gro Growth Initiative here at Brookings um, on AGOA, uh, and that's being distributed this morning. Uh, the title is um, The Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, an Empirical Analysis of the Possibilities Post-2015. And it examines the different ways in which the legislation uh, may or may not move forward um, after the current legislation expires in 2015. Uh, so this discussion is especially timely, um, and I know we'll get a very lively discussion. So I'd like to turn over the floor to Mwangi Kinmeni, uh, the Director and Senior Fellow of the Africa Growth Initiative. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the introduction and welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Froman, for uh, thank you very much for joining us. I guess the last time uh, we were with you in, uh, uh, this time of the year we were with you in uh, Aspen, uh, discussing poverty. Now we'll be talking about trade, which are not necessarily uh, dis dis disconnected, so they are the same. Uh, I'd like to start by congratulating you uh, on this new appointment, cabinet level appointment, and we look forward to working with you just as we worked with you when you are at uh, the White House. Now, I would like to just get this conversation started. Uh, Africa is becoming increasingly important, and uh, if you look at the U.S.-Africa trade relationship, how would you characterize it? Are you, you know, is it good, poor, uh, or is it uh, requires improvement, or how do you see it? Well, uh, thank you. First of all, thanks very much uh, for having me, and uh, it's good to be back at Brookings, and I'm uh, enormously grateful to Brookings for putting out this report, because as you say, it is very timely. This is uh, a very good time to start looking at AGOA, and this is exactly the kind of analysis and report that we want to see to be able to feed into the process that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. I think to answer your question, I, I think uh, the trading relationship, the economic relationship is good, but could be much more substantial. And I think we should start by recognizing the success of AGOA. Uh, our two-way trade has uh, more than doubled. Our exports to Africa have tripled. Non-oil exports to the U.S have tripled. Mm -hmm. It is supported by some estimates 1.3 million jobs uh, in Africa. And by all those metrics, it, it, is, uh, it is a significant success. But we should be frank with each other. The numbers are still quite small. And we should look at this next phase of AGOA to see what we can do to build upon the success of the last 13 years and take the relationship uh, even further. I was in uh, Africa recently, as you know, with uh, the president. Yeah. I accompanied him on part of his trip, and everywhere he went, the issues of trade and investment came up. It was the underlying theme of his trip. Uh, Anagoa was very much, uh, uh, very much at the center there. And so 
we want to, to look at AGOA, build on its successes, and figure out where to take this going forward. Oh, very good. Uh, just to touch on, uh, follow up on the trip with the president, uh, which of course we've been uh, waiting for a long time and we are happy that the president was able to make the trip to Africa. When you listen to Africans, I mean, what did you get when talking to the Africans, whether it's the business community, whether the politicians, what, what are you getting from them and what their expectations are uh, about uh, U.S. Africa? Well, first, I think we need to put it in the context of, of how much has changed over the last 13 years and what's going on in Africa. Uh, now, you know, I often talk about how uh, the Economist once had a, uh, a a cover that was talking about the the lost continent. Mm -hmm. uh, now talks about Africa rising, and the fact that six out of ten of the fastest growing economies of the world uh, are in Africa mm -hmm. or in Sub-Saharan Africa. That you have a whole new cadre of leaders, uh, not in every country, but in many countries, who are willing to take on economic reform, willing to put political will behind economic reform, putting economic skin in the game in terms of devoting some of their domestic resources to food security and education and health, to build systems and to, to move off of uh, just humanitarian crisis to humanitarian crisis. So there's a lot going on that is, uh, uh, that is new and, and different and, and noteworthy there. You know, to answer your question, when the president was there, everywhere he went, uh, there was an emphasis on that this is not just about aid anymore, but also about trade, not just about assistance, but also about investment. And whether it was the private sector or government officials or young leaders or jurists, all of their, all of their input very much went to what do we need to do to continue to build and create the economic environment, the enabling environment for private sector gr led growth, uh, for stronger relations, within Africa, among African countries, but also between Africa and major markets around the world. And that's what really informs our effort there. Oh, great. So now uh, the president has uh, now about three plus years more. And uh, what do you see as the big, now you just got in as, uh, as a U.S. Trade Representative, and uh, what do you see as the big things or some key issues that will probably make a difference? Or, or how do you think the president will make a mark or a legacy in Africa? So first, I think we want to build on some of the work that we've been doing in the last uh, four and a half years uh, on food security, for example. The president really put food security back on the global agenda uh, four years ago now. It was in July in, at, the, at the summit in L'Aquila, mm -hmm. Italy, when he mobilized $22.5 billion of support around the world. We launched Feed the Future here in the United States. And then when he chaired the G8 summit in Camp David in 2012, launching the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, which took our food security initiative to, to a new level and partnered with countries who wanted to engage in reform, but also partnered with the private sector, mm -hmm. mobilizing more than $4 billion in private sector investment commitments for the, the countries that are part of the program. That program is continuing to develop. More countries are joining. We want to see that move uh, f uh, farther and, and faster through the continent. Um, there's obviously the health agenda, which we will continue to build on, where we can now, for the first time, envisage uh, turning the, the corner on HIV and AIDS to the possibility of an AIDS-free uh, generation. Uh, but as the President uh, noted when he was in Africa on this trip, we need to move beyond that, and that's where he also launched Power Africa and Trade Africa. Yeah. Power Africa, the goal of which is to, to you know, right now, two-thirds of Sub-Saharan Africans don't have access reliable access to affordable electricity. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to double access um, uh, going forward and mobilizing, using government resources to mobilize private sector investment, use, working with the partner governments to put in place the necessary laws and regulations so that we can bring greater electricity around Africa, clean energy as well, um, which is an important force multiplier for education, for health, for economic productivity, for safety and security. And so it has a tremendous broad benefits on economic development. And then finally, Trade Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm taking so long to answer That's your question, right. but we have a lot on the agenda. Uh, uh, Trade Africa, which has really a number of different components. One is focusing on regional integration, mm -hmm. working initially with the East African community, uh, but also uh, with the other economic communities to help deepen their economic integration mm -hmm. efforts, help implement their customs union, for example, uh, work as they negotiate with the other economic communities, a continent-wide free trade uh, area, but also focus on 
on issues like uh, borders and trade facilitation and how long it takes to get something from port to market uh, and uh, take those other costs out of the system so that African producers can become more competitive and trade more with each other as well as with the rest of the world. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me turn back to Agoa. Uh, you have already actually provided a bit of assessment uh, of Agoa, the broad assessment, and you also mentioned that there is still more that we, you know, the promise is still not yet uh, achieved. Uh, what is in many people's minds, of course, particularly when you are going to Addis Ababa, particularly the African government, uh, is uh, Agoa is expiring. Uh, what do you see on this? I know when the president was uh, in Africa, he said that Agoa, he worked to have Agoa extended. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do you see the extension and uh, what, uh, what form or what do you think should be changed in, in Agoa? Well, as the president said, we want to see the seamless renewal of AGOA, and we know how important that is to people making investment decisions, to know in advance whether they'll still benefit from uh, those uh, preference, preferences and preferential access to the U.S. market. It plays a key role in whether or not they maintain their investments and, and add to them. So we want to make sure that there's a seamless renewal of AGOA. But we also want to use this period. We have two, a little over two years now before AGOA expires. We want to use this period uh, to really, as I said, look at the successes of AGOA, but also ways in which uh, it can be improved. We'll also look at the changes in the continent, the changing economic relationships and trade relationships that have developed between Africa and, and other economic partners around the world, and see what kind of changes we want to make to AGOA before mm -hmm. working with Congress. And obviously, Congress plays yeah. the critical role here in, in figuring out what kind of AGOA we want to renew. I think that's a very good point about making sure that it's renewed in advance because of uh, certainty. I think we were very surprised last year uh, when it came to the third country fabric provision, which was, I think, renewed the last, almost the last day uh, before it expired. And of course, as uh, investors uh, look at AGOA, they would like to make sure that uh, this actually happens uh, before. Now, uh, now, in your new role as, uh, at USTR, what do you see as the main role of USTR in this process, particularly in supporting trade uh, in Africa? Where, where, what are the goals that you set yourselves to, to, to focus on? Well, we're going we're gonna to very much focus on AGOA and, and this review process, which we hope to launch next week in, in Addis uh, at the AGOA Forum. Uh, we'll work with our interagency partners as well to ensure that we're bringing a whole of government approach to expanding the relationship. Um, and in addition to my trip, next week to, to Ethiopia. Uh, we expect that, that Secretary Pritzker of the Commerce Department will go to Africa sometime in the next year, uh, that uh, Secretary Liu, Secretary Moniz are all planning trips to Africa uh, over the next uh, year or so. And that's part of implementing the, the President's Sub-Saharan Africa strategy about bringing all of the resources we have across the government to strengthening, uh, to strengthening our relations. At USTR, we'll focus on AGOA. We'll also focus on um, uh, trade Africa, the relationship with the East African community, mm -hmm. implementing that, uh, working with other, um, uh, for example, in ECOWAS, working on uh, ECOWAS agreements and in our other bilateral agreements, including with South Africa, to ensure we're resolving outstanding trade issues and doing everything we can to strengthen the, the, the economic and, and trade and investment relationship. So one of the things we find in our report is that although there are a lot of gains from doing uh, business with the United States and Europe and all other countries, one of the key benefits uh, comes from internal trade. Right. Uh, the, uh, the, the regional integration trading within Africa is really where a lot of benefits lie. So that uh, uh, the focus on the East African community is good. But what are you doing generally in terms of supporting regional integration uh, within Africa, which is key? for Africa's uh, development. And it's absolutely key, as you say. And when you compare Sub-Saharan Africa to a number of other regions in the world, the amount of intra-regional trade is really uh, quite low. And so there's great potential there to strengthen those trading relationships. You know, through initiatives like Trade Africa, we're going to try and work to, to break down barriers at the border and make logistics and other systems more efficient. You know, it takes, uh, and, and, and uh, there are many reports out there on this matter, but it takes far too long to get yep. a, uh, a ship unloaded at a port and those products move from port to the border of the, of the, of the next country. Uh, there have been some mappings of roadblocks mm -hmm. where you'll find 40 roadblocks between the port and the, and the next 
uh, and, the, and the next border. And we need to work with the governments to try and reduce the number of roadblocks, literally and figuratively. And then when they get to the border, the two custom systems don't always talk to each other. They're based on different systems. So we're working, one thing that USAID is, is working hard at, is to work with the EAC countries to put in place, first of all, an IT system that allows the different custom services to share information with yeah. each other. And over time, hopefully to help move towards a single custom system where there can be a revenue sharing uh, arrangement to make that the customs union, uh, you know, the EAC has already taken a number of the very difficult decisions about agreeing to a customs union and, and they're moving further and further along in terms of regional integration. Now comes the time to implement those decisions and we want to be a partner of theirs in helping them do that. And then as the EAC and the other regional organizations mm -hmm. negotiate with each other and begin to create a, a continental wide uh, free, tra mm -hmm. free trade area, we stand ready to work with them to help them in that regard as well. well that's great. I think, uh, I think their focus on regional integration is really important, particularly it's when there's harmonization also within the U.S. government agencies and focusing on uh, regional integration. So I, th I think that will really be a key to Africa's growth. And I think I'll turn to the audience uh, to see what uh, they, they have. Uh, we have uh, just first of all, like, thank you very much for that uh, opening remarks. Uh, first of all, this is a public event, so uh, anything you say is on record. So don't uh, come back and say you didn't mean it. Um, <laughs> then the uh, second thing, we have very few minutes, and the ambassador is really preparing, as you know, he's uh, going for the Agua meetings in, uh, in, uh, in Addis Ababa, and there are a lot of things to prepare. And he has also a press interview after. So we have only, right now we have 20, we have uh, 30 minutes for, for, for discussion. So when, for your interventions, please be very specific. And I'm going to constrain uh, your questions to AGOA. Uh, forget about all other questions about uh, the administration of what the ambassador was doing at the White House. Let's focus on AGOA and be brief. Uh, so can I take those questions? I'll start with Steve Landy, and uh, please uh, be very uh, quickly. And then I'll go to the ambassador of Mauritius, although you... Steve, Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. Uh, probably being the oldest person here, I remember Bob Strauss's days when he came, good White House contacts. I cannot tell you how much the trade community and the African community is waiting for, has waited for you and so happy you're here. We also have heard you say that you want to improve a goal, but first you want to listen, which is such a good point. So let me just put two or three really quick ideas on the table for you to think about. First, most important thing, regional integration. It would be nice if you could talk to your European friends and say at the same time as you were doing the TTIP with them, can you please not undermine efforts in Africa by asking, by dividing Africa up as you may be doing with economic partnership agreements. Secondly, please bring the whole of government approach also to Congress. There were so many good initiatives. If you could put them all together in the same way as you did in the administration, that would be absolutely fantastic. And three, uh, the ambassador's report that just came out is excellent. They listed seven or eight recommendations at the very beginning in terms of their report. If we could begin discussing them in AGOA, the stakeholders are here, this could be very positive. Thank you again for giving us 15 minutes on a very busy day. Uh, now, I'm not going to allow anyone else to give that uh, talk except Steve. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask the ambassador of uh, Mauritius a very brief question. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Brookings, for organizing this uh, conversation. And uh, actually, I don't have a question. I uh, am talking on behalf of the African Ambassadors Group. And since you're talking about AGOA, I would like to, and I'm very much happy that Steve Lendy, our friend, has already given his total endorsement to the recommendations that the African Ambassadors Group has come as regards AGOA. Uh, it is a report that has been worked out together with all the ambassadors, and also which has included the private sector people, representatives from the uh, civil society, think tank experts, uh, officials from the USTR uh, who have uh, attended informally, uh, 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 officials from the State Department, and all the rest of this. It has been an inclusive one. And it has also been endorsed by the AGUA annual uh, meeting the recommendation that we have made. What we are saying in brief, that after consultations and after quite deep uh, thinking, we have come to the conclusion that AGOA should be renewed at least for a period of 15 years, and the third country fabric 
the, uh, the, the textile and apparel which has been a success story of the AGOA should be made coterminous and extended for the same period. There are, okay. And also the enhanced political dialogue yeah. and which has already been started by President okay. Obama and we want more of that. There are many other recommendations, the recommendations okay. contain. Thank you very much for your Okay, patience. let me give a little bit more guidance. I want, we want to get as much <laughs> as possible. <laughs> we like to get as much as possible from the ambassador. I know he will get that presentation in Addis Ababa. So, can we, I, I'm, if you know it's not a question, please. Yes. Uh, okay, very direct. Then I'll go uh, back. And, uh, well, thank you very much. I guess my question directly is, what uh, are you doing, uh, Mr. Secretary, to ensure that the Congress passes our recommendation, the Act, renews it as soon as possible? Okay. So let me go to, I'll take three. Sure. Okay. okay. And the ambassador, uh, may I talk to the gentleman over there, uh, it's uh, Kerry. Hi, I'm Kevin Kelly, I write for the Nation Media Group in Kenya. One of the premises of AGOA is to encourage good governance as well as to develop economically. I'm wondering to what extent you'll weigh governance factors in terms of maybe the provisions in the renewed AGOA, but also right now, specifically in the case of a country like Kenya, where the national leadership is under indictment for crimes against humanity. Thanks. Uh, maybe let me ask this gentleman, uh, gentleman here, please. Question, please. And then. Uh, I am Dr. Nishar Chaudhary with Pakistan American League. I have uh, my one question is that uh, China is also very much uh, in Africa, uh, well entrenched. Uh, do you think the pace at which USA is moving into Africa, uh, giving ideas and making investments and enhancing the volume of trade, how would you compare it uh, with the approach of Chinese, with the approach of Americans? And uh, also, uh, uh, what, is, uh, what do you think, uh, uh, why not to include even more countries in this uh, AGO group uh, where you are already doing trade? Okay, I've got, I think the first question on Agoa you pretty much have answered on working on the extension, so you can sure. add on that, but sure. uh, I think the bigger question there is on China and Africa, and, and the others who have more comments. Good. Well, first of all, just to, to take up the question directly, we're already beginning our conversations uh, with members of Congress, interested members of Congress, about AGOA, and they'll very much be part of this review process. It'll be an iterative process. We'll consult very closely with them so that we can build support for AGOA when it's time to, to resubmit it. I'm, uh, delighted that, uh, for example, Senator Isaacson uh, from Georgia will be, uh, is planning on joining us in Ethiopia next week, uh, along with uh, uh, Congresswoman Bass from California. Um, and so uh, they'll be part and participate in the AGOA forum as well. So we're already beginning that, mm -hmm. that process. You know, I think on, on uh, let me try governance and, and China. Governance is absolutely uh, a critical part of this overall effort. And it's something that the president has <clears throat> underscored more generally, in the launch of the Open Government Partnership, for example, uh, that now has over 50 countries that have joined and put in action plans about transparency and accountability and anti-corruption. Uh, this is something we're going to emphasize everywhere. It's something he emphasized when he was in Africa, um, both when he met with jurists in Senegal and, and when he met with young African leaders in, uh, uh, in, in South Africa, including others from around the, the continent. So governance is going to be very much uh, a focus and will be part of our consideration for AGOA uh, going, going forward. Um, and then on China, um, you know, I, I'd refer you back to what the President said when he was asked about this in, in Africa. From our perspective, um, this is, uh, it, is, uh, it is good that China and Brazil and Turkey and India and, and Europe and so many other uh, 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 countries are interested and involved in Africa. And the question for Africans is what kind of trade and investment relationships do they want to have? It's up to them with outside partners and ensuring that it works for them. And we're very much confident because as we travel around Africa, as I did last year to a number of countries and, and then again back again this year, as much as the Chinese are there, they want Americans to be there as well because they know that our companies, they bring technology and management training that they hire locally that they like to build uh, local capacity. You know, I was so delighted to see uh, you know, a, a, a Kenyan woman be the, the general manager of the, the regional GM facility in, in, 
in Nairobi. Um, uh, and when I would go to places where there were investments from the U.S. and investments from other countries, people always underscored that when the Americans come in, they hire locally, they train locally. They're not interested in just taking resources out of the country. They're interested in investing in human resources uh, in the country. And that, to, to me, is a great landmark of our involvement there. So it's not that we're going, we're just discovering Africa. We've been there for a while. You know, we, we've been there for a while, and AGOA, you know, uh, is one of the great indications that 13 years ago, we made this major commitment uh, uh, to the region. So uh, we're going to continue to build on our, our presence there. Uh, we're encouraging. We have a Doing Business in Africa campaign to encourage American firms to be more involved there. I think a number of these visits that I mentioned from Secretary Pritzker and others will involve, will likely involve the private sector and doing trade missions and, and helping to deepen the relationship between Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the United States. And so it's very much part of our overall agenda. Okay, take the three more. I'll take the gentleman over there, this one, and opposite, and I'll come to the, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your remarks. My, my name is Duza Baba. I'm based in Abuja I, and focus in West Africa. And there are two commodities that are sort of key for West Africa, which I've seen in the report here. One is cotton and another peanuts. Can you, um, with the renewing Agoa in 2015, could you uh, ensure that those commodities get 100% um, DFDQ access to the US markets? Because based on the report here also, West Africa really, the countries in West Africa are not really benefiting that much from Agoa. So I'd like to hear your remarks. Thank that, you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman up th just opposite there, yeah. And then I'll come to, I'll come to you and um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Froman. My name is uh, Arend Kowener. I'm a former staff member of the IMF. I'm currently working with some African governments. I have two questions on Agoa. The first is the Brookings report uh, that just came out. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, seems to suggest that it is not a good thing to uh, extend the, be the benefits of AGOA or AGOA type of benefits to other poor countries in the world. What is your view on that? I mean, I, my own view is that, of course, it's good to support Africa, but is it good to withhold uh, similar benefits to other also poor countries? The second question is on the use of, the, of AGOA as a political instrument to force uh, change in some African countries. Uh, uh, a couple of countries come to mind. One uh, recent case is, uh, uh, is the, the withdrawal of AGOA for Madagascar. Um, the, uh, poverty, the unemployment has increased enormously. A couple of hundred thousand more people unemployed. Uh, poverty has increased by 10 percentage points from 70 to 80 in that country. So what is your view on that and what is your interpretation Good. of what is uh, called a coup or what is a popular uh, call for change? Thank you. Okay. Could I get the, the gentleman there, those two gentlemen? And that, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, we're delighted that Brookings is honoring uh, Mr. Foreman. My name is Fred Oladende. I am the chair of the Agoa Civil Society Network. I, would, I have two questions. One is regarding Trade Africa. Uh, we were at the DVC last week with colleagues in Africa, and we hope you will join us during our opening plenary session in Addis Ababa. And one of the key point that was raised by our colleagues in Addis Ababa is how do we ensure that when AGOA is extended that the issue of supply side constraint is fully addressed. Mm. We have 6,800 articles on AGOA and GSP and we've seen very few of them used. What is USTR doing on that trade Africa to ensure that African civil society included in terms of working with their parliament, just as we are doing here in the United States, to remove the supply uh, side constraint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman, and the, then we got to answers. Yeah. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, how is the internet being used in your operations to get more transparency and get the private sector funding in and have open meetings? Good. I think we can, Ambassador, these are very good questions. Uh, one of them has to do with the uh, product uh, eligibility. I think we have uh, been making arguments about uh, what happens about peanuts, for example. And when you add milk, uh, the rates go up very high. Anything to do with sugar and, and all that. Uh, but then this cotton and peanuts issue, uh, I will leave you to this question on the 
ago I like benefits to Bangladesh and the Cambodians. Let's see how you answer, but yeah. <laughs> These are good questions, so let me, uh, let me try and take them. Yeah. I think with regard to, to specific uh, uh, products, yeah, there obviously are we, sensitive products. Every country has got them. These are the sort, this is the kind of input that we want to take. Mm -hmm. And as we look at uh, AGO as a whole in the context of what we're doing in GSP, what we're doing in uh, other mechanisms, we want to look at the, all of the, the, the possibilities and then see where the sensitivities uh, are and how they can be managed. So I'm not going to commit to you now uh, what will happen with cotton and, and peanuts, only to say that it's, uh, it's important to have that input. And then as we look at it, we'll look at these issues uh, as well and see how best to manage the, the sensitivities around them. You know, on the other countries uh, uh, question, it's a very interesting question. And it happens also as we are negotiating uh, uh, TPP or TTIP or other free trade agreements as well, that countries that with whom we have FTAs um, uh, raise questions about what impact new FTAs will have on their preferential um, access. We need to figure out, obviously, uh, poverty everywhere is, a, is of concern, but we need to figure out how to move forward with our anti-poverty agenda without eroding the benefits that we've already granted uh, to countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's, again, one of those issues I need to think we need to look at in the context of GSP and our other uh, programs uh, as well. I mean, on, the, on the political issue, I really go back to the answer I, I gave on, on governance. Um, I think we, and, and it's the same approach we take on uh, in another, a number of other areas like MCC and how MCC is implemented. You know, we fundamentally believe that ec sustainable economic development requires good governance. Mm -hmm. And we want to encourage good governance as a key part, rule of law and, and the like, as a key part of, uh, of a sustainable economic uh, agenda. And so it will be an issue, I imagine, mm -hmm. in how we consider uh, managing these programs uh, as well, on the supply side, uh, the supply side uh, constraints. I, I think it's a very important point because the one reason we're focusing on trade facilitation, for example, both in Geneva uh, in terms of a multilateral agreement, but very much central to what we're trying to do with the East African community and, and, and other communities uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a recognition that our tariffs are probably the least uh, important cost imposed on an export from Sub-Saharan Africa. It, it pales in comparison to the transportation costs and the logistics costs and, as you say, the supply side constraints of getting a product from, uh, from farm to market or from market to the, the global marketplace. And so we want to look at this holistically and see what we can do to make the region more competitive as a whole so it can take full advantage of AGOA and other preference programs around the world and, and uh, participates in, in the global market. And with regard to the, uh, the internet and transparency, it, uh, uh, obviously we're, we're, we are looking very hard at the whole issue of transparency and how to ensure we're using all the tools at our disposal to communicate effectively with, with Congress, with uh, stakeholders, uh, and with the public uh, more generally. And I imagine that will be part of this AGOA review as well. Uh, thank you. I, I think the issue of these political conditionalities may be something that uh, I think they need to be addressed. Uh, and the reason why we've been arguing that there need to be some change in the way the provision is, is that when you have Madagascar, for example, which is one, a part of a, of a regional value chain, you know, so that you know, it's supplying parts to other countries. The moment Madagascar becomes ineligible, you also break the production chains in other countries. And so this is an issue that uh, we think that uh, you may want to look at more uh, CDSA to see whether you can give some allowance for a couple, six months, one year, uh, for them to behave, uh, so that you can uh, so that the production continues because these chains get broken and you, are, you end up with the negative impacts in different other countries. So okay, so I'll take another round of uh, questions. I would go to the back now. The gentleman right at the back over there, next to the camera. Yeah. Dick America from Georgetown School of Business. Uh, you mentioned uh, agricultural products. What about uh, metals, copper, iron ore, value-added processing and manufacturing in those sectors? I understand they're sensitive, but nevertheless, uh, building the manufacturing sector in Africa is ought to be a priority, and AGOA can help drive it. OK, so somebody else? Uh, another question? Uh, right at the back also.
Uh, yes, hello, it's Adam B. Sudi from Inside Your Straight. I just was hoping you could explain with maybe a little more detail the scope of the review. Um, what specific areas are you going to be looking at? Is it just product uh, coverage? Uh, but, you know, can you explain with a little more detail what you hope the review will include? Okay, yes, the gentleman, then I'll come to, yeah. Yeah, uh, Len Bracken, Bloomberg b &A. Could you give us a sort of a preview of how the meetings will be conducted? Uh, will some of the uh, issues regarding product graduation or country graduation be discussed openly or confidentially? <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't you take those? We'll take one more out, but uh, why don't you get those ones? Great. Well, I, I think in terms of the review itself, I wouldn't want to totally preempt my speech next week at the AGOA forum, otherwise you wouldn't pay attention to it. So uh, you know, I will lay out more details then in terms of how we're going to conduct the review. But the intent is not just to look at product coverage, but to look at many of the issues that have already been raised here, including how does it relate to other economic arrangements? Um, you know, is What are the criteria for graduation of either products or mm -hmm or countries? How do we think about reciprocity in the notion of this? How do we take into account the changing nature of what's going on in the African uh, economies? Uh, how does it relate to other preference programs and other uh, trading arrangements? Uh, and, and how does uh, the coverage and the, the, the scope of OGOA relate to the other barriers between mm -hmm. what's going on in Africa and, and, and their involvement in the global marketplace? So we expect, we expect it to be a broad-based a broad-based review, uh, not simply uh, what kind of product coverage there might be. I think to the, the, the gentleman's uh, point about manufacturing, I think it's a very important point because, again, one of the messages we heard loud and clear on this most recent trip uh, is that countries want to climb the value-added chain. They want to do more manufacturing of their, of their raw materials in-country and get more of the value, and they'd like to make sure that their trading arrangements uh, with us or, or other major trading partners around the world reflect their priority, that priority of theirs. And so I imagine that'll be one of the issues that gets discussed in the context of this review. Um, you mentioned the, the, pro, uh, the process, the density in uh, trade, uh, uh, the CIPROC arrangements. Would you maybe comment something on EPS? Uh, no, I don't think I would comment. Uh, uh, no, let me, let me simply say uh, we have followed with great interest uh, what our European yeah. uh, colleagues uh, are doing and their approach to this. Uh, uh, we've obviously taken one approach. They're taking a slightly different approach. Uh, I think part of this review and, and part of this dialogue will be around uh, what are the lessons learned from different approaches? How do they interact? How do we think about that? I mean, I will say, and it came up, uh, it came up while we were in South Africa, um, the fact that South Africa has a free trade agreement with uh, the European mm -hmm. Union that's currently being implemented, um, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have stakeholders who are raising the question of why we should allow South African products into the United States under AGOA duty-free when our companies mm -hmm. are now facing a co competitive disadvantage in terms of access <coughs> to the South African market. That's one issue that will have to be discussed as part of this overall discussion. Okay, very good. Uh, so I, I take another, I think we have one more round of questions, hopefully. Uh, the gentleman there, yeah. Yes, thank you very much for coming. My name is Lou Diggs. I'm an independent consultant. Outside the trade sphere, there's more and more discussion about product certification, uh, specifically with respect to transparency and governance and so on, such as the Dodd-Frank provisions on conflict minerals. Uh, these certification discussions are covering increasingly broad categories of uh, commodity. Do you see this as part of the AGOA talks? Okay. Uh, any other question? Yes. Uh, before Steve. Okay, uh, Steve. I'm going to ask questions this time real fast. Okay. Uh, one, if you're seriously about considering about, if you're considering supply side ideas, let me put on the table that you have to change the origin rules so you give credit for a product where Africa doesn't produce the final product, but they make an input along the value chain. And that's just one idea that's on the table. Um, I think if you look at the tariffs, you'll find out that in the agricultural products, for example, tobacco, the duty is 350%, similar rates in peanuts and other products. So I think in a few agricultural products, but again, 
The reason I don't want to ask too many questions is because yeah. you said you want to hear us, but nevertheless, this could be one issue that's well worth looking at. And then in terms of conditionality, I think many of us support it, but we really believe that there should be more emphasis perhaps on peer pressure, working with the African countries themselves, the idea of the U.S. taking unilateral action. So again, could that be a way to address the issue, to keeping our values but making sure we're more effective by working with other countries in terms of getting something done? Nothing's worse than Madagascar, where not only do we undermine the supply chain, but we threw 50,000 uh, seamstresses out of work, and we have the thugs are still there running the government. Thank you. Steve uh, somehow probably squeezed in a question there, although I didn't get it. <laughs> but <laughs> so, uh, why don't you go? I got some more questions here, so we can. Great. Yeah. Well, let me just, I, I think, uh, uh, to Steve's questions, um, <laughs> uh, we'll take them all on board, and obviously we want to be as effective as we can as we seek to, to promote uh, uh, democratic values and, and governance reforms. Uh, with regard to, uh, to Dodd-Frank and, and the Cardin Luger uh, amendment, the, I think the only thing I would add is, I'm not sure that'll be part of the AGOA discussion per se, since uh, mm -hmm. it's very much part of US law, it's currently being litigated, uh, it's an issue for regulation for the, for the SEC to, uh, to, uh, uh, to deal with, um, but I think we think it's, a, it's been an important um, innovation in terms of requiring greater transparency uh, in a sector um, that has been the source of great potential economic activity and growth, but also has been the cause of, of, of some governance issues over history, and we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to bring transparency to, to that sector. Okay, maybe two more questions, two final questions. Yes, the gentleman in the back, and uh, with someone. Um, Al Milliken, uh, AM Media. The other issues the uh, U.S. has been involved with, particularly something like AIDS, how m much intersection is there with uh, trade and what you're involved with? So that was on, is that aid? Uh, not AIDS. 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 AIDS or aid? AIDS and, AIDS, AIDS and uh, trade. Okay, one more. I guess that was also part of the uh, health, uh, health, uh, health program. Yes, that it. Good morning, and thank you again for being here. Uh, Shannon Pemberthy with Procter and Gamble is a company that's already been manufacturing on the continent for more than fifty years. We'd be interested in hearing what you'd have to say about the role you think for U.S. manufacturing on the continent and how we could be a partner uh, with the U.S. government in advancing more opportunities there. Maybe following up on that, uh, there have been some uh, uh, other proposals in Congress uh, about in increasing American exports to Africa. And um, how, how are you looking at this? Uh, you know, how do you see this tying up with AGOA or other U.S. Uh, initiatives that would increase the, 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 the benefits in terms of exports to, to Africa? Well, thank you. I think, first of all, in terms of our overall approach on, on health, um, uh, yeah, we view health and food and power and trade as part of a coherent, comprehensive um, development agenda with Africa. And so um, uh, there's no direct linkage between one or the other, only that we want healthy, growing economies that are educating their people and have the electricity to power their economies uh, trading with us as well. And that's we want to see all the parts of the government, of our government, uh, working with all the parts of their governments to make that, uh, to make that come together. I think the, the example of PNG is a, is a very good one. In fact, when I was in uh, uh, Abuja last year. You were just doing a ribbon cutting on a $250 million plant there. Uh, in October, it's fantastic. And I think the more that U.S. companies uh, make those sorts of investments and see success and are able to demonstrate that success to their other American company counterparts, one of the great things, I, one of the great challenges I think that Africa wrestles with is uh, the gap between real risk and risk perception. And there are real risks, and we should be frank about that. There are, are tremendous problems and challenges in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, from security to, to economic and social and, and governance. 
But there is at times, uh, first of all, it's not a homogeneous place, as you all know, uh, and there is at times a gap between the real risks on one hand and the risk perceptions on the other. Nothing breeds success like success. And to the degree that American companies are, are going in, making sizable investments, and being successful at it, that can be a very positive, have a very positive carryover effect onto other countries uh, as well. We're certainly encouraging of that. That's a little bit of what our Doing Business in Africa campaign is about, a bit of what the trade missions are about, that uh, the people will be leading over there, and that's very much uh, a dynamic that we want to, uh, that we want to underscore. I think to your point about other legislation and other support, um, uh, we're gonna be looking at all of that and obviously wanting to consult with our, our, uh, our colleagues on the Hill as we look at AGOA, but also look at their ideas for how to expand the, the U.S. economic relationship with <coughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. There's a lot of interest up there in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, both in supporting the economic development there, but also very much as a market for, uh, for U.S. investment and for U.S. exports. And that's why we want to make sure as we go through this process, we are, uh, we are doing so in a way that maximizes uh, and, the, and strengthens the bilateral relationship. Very good. We are almost coming uh, to the end of time, but I, I wanted to go back a little bit on the, on the trip that you took very briefly. One of the recommendations we've been making here in our previous publications was that uh, we would like to see President Obama with a brain full of uh, business people, which, which seems to, to have happened. And the other recommendations was we were saying that uh, you get uh, high-level meetings with the pres president of China, with the Af um, uh, African presidents, and now that's going to happen next year. Right. Uh, you think uh, President Obama has changed his uh, view, or, or is, well, has something happened the last uh, few? It seems to be an acceleration of his interest in Africa, his strategies. Well, look, I think he's, he's always had a very strong interest in Africa and in development. It's one reason at the beginning of this administration that he took on the issue of food security. Yeah. Uh, now, it wasn't limited to Africa, but a big po focus of it was was there and launched the Feed the Future initiative with, with Secretary uh, Clinton uh, and, and Raj Shah at USAID. Uh, it's one reason he did the new alliance, which is very much focused on Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, at least initially, um, and had a very interesting meeting at Camp David at the G8, not just with African leaders, government leaders, but with the African private sector. It was the first time you had a meeting like that at a G8 summit to talk about food security and what we could all do together, <coughs> governments, donors, private sector. And that's the same approach that he's taken to power and to, and to trade Africa as well. So he's had a long-standing interest, a long-standing commitment. He certainly has uh, pressed us and encouraged us to be as aggressive as we could in, in developing um, uh, initiatives for supporting uh, what's going on in Africa. And that's been our, that's been our, our way. I think uh, uh, you're right that uh, uh, he's called for a summit here next year of all, of all the African leaders. He met with when he was in Senegal, he met uh, with food security, agricultural-related uh, businesses. In South Africa, uh, Valerie Jarrett and I and others met with uh, financial uh, investors in Africa. And then in Tanzania, he met with a very interesting group of CEOs, both from American firms, actually European firms as well, and African firms to talk about the investment environment in Africa. So he's very much focused on everything that we can do, including from a governance perspective and, and helping to promote young leaders that will help contribute to trade and investment in Africa. Thank you very much. Some of us were a little discouraged, but we are happier now. <laughs> I, I, I think we will be happier as the time goes on, but we are a bit discouraged. But we, we feel uh, some confidence that uh, we are going somewhere with the new Af US Africa trade, uh, trade, I mean, relation, commercial relations, and, and other uh, aspects. So we are, we are happy with the trip and uh, these proposals that uh, have come up. And we are very happy that you are there. Now, uh, we are very, uh, let's let's uh, thank uh, uh, Ambassador for this uh, uh, Fabio. We, we were given uh, we were given uh, up to this time, and since we would like to have him again, I don't want to abuse the, the that uh, honor. But could you please hold on because uh, he will, his security will take him to another place just for like two minutes. Uh, less than a minute and we walk to the, together with our uh, trustee, thank you very much uh, for, for honoring us also with these uh, uh, introductions, uh, introducing our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.